Jesus, my big brother, uh, Fanny Kayode, um, used the clues of his remark to end my speech. And then my younger brother, Demola, uses his entire speech to make my own. <laughs> but you know, I guess that's what life is all about. When there's a burning issue in the nation, then people will talk about it regardless. And like all things in life, it's all about the choices we make. And we make choices at every stage in life. And the choices we make have consequences. You see, when I was a child, I grew up learning about choices and consequences. And I learned it often at the end of a king. I understood that when I made a choice, and that choice was going to end with a punishment, then once I have already started down that line, then I had better enjoy myself so totally in that line because the consequence was inevitable. That was the home I came, grew up in. And the Nigeria that we live in today is all about the choices you make. The choices you make as a youth, the choices you make as an adult, the choices you have even made coming to sit down here. Guess what? Because the consequences will follow. Do not be, do not be deceived. Every choice we make in this nation has a consequence. Today, I'm a bit older, maybe a little bit wiser. I have just been told that I'm not a youth, and Nigeria tells us that we're all youths till we're about 70. But having said that, I know that one of the things that we have been called to, our own generation, is to stand as a bridge for this youth generation to the ones that we understand and the politics for which we have seen our father's generation. They've done their own, they've played their part, and they have moved. And so today, it amazes me every single time that I hear us complain. We complain about Wayek, and we say that we have the worst results in English, the worst results in mathematics, and we think that it just happened. Cause and consequence. We talk about medical tourism. It didn't just happen. It didn't just happen. We didn't just wake up to find out that we spend 500 billion, 500 million, 500 million dollars every year exporting medical tourism to India. It did not just happen. We didn't just wake up one day and we found it like that. We didn't just, it did not just happen that many of our children are being educated outside of Nigeria. It didn't just happen. Many people spend their last hard-end naira, hard-end, hard-end. They sweat to send their children to any country outside of Nigeria that would give them a visa where they believe that the school is better. My friends on BBM, they spend hours going on and on and on abusing the government, as Fanny Kayode said, on Boko Haram. Abuse, left, right, and center. They never once criticized Boko Haram. Never once. Yet, they spend more time and more passion bemoaning or laughing, more like laughing, at Manchester United's demise and bemoaning how Arsenal disappoints them every day than they spend criticizing Boko Haram even once. We don't talk about issues. We're not serious many times about the things that concern us most because we don't feel that the choice and the consequence correlate but they do correlate. And so everywhere I turn, as I meet people, and I meet people every day, I see them, we look into their eyes and they are dazed, battered by the state of the economy that they live in. Yet, this is the only country that I know of where we have 140 million people and every single one of them, every single one of them, every single one of them believes that my fortune will change tomorrow. 140 million people with doing nothing except praying and waiting that their brother, their friend, their cousin, somebody they know will enter where? Government. And that the day
way the person enters government, it's passport to bliss. No education, no qualification. The only thing that you have going for you is that either I am in government, or my brother is in government, or somebody I know is in government. That's the only catalyst. Cause and effect. The case in point, I was talking to a friend of mine as we were coming into Abuja today, and we remembered a man who we both know. This man cannot put two words of English together. As my friend said, when he had to sign his name, he couldn't sign his name. He was an errand boy. And I will save his name for you because I don't want to embarrass him. However, in this whole thing about opportunity, he had a brother who got into the corridors of power at the highest level of the land. This is a man I know. From the day his brother got in, he became the henchman of his brother. A political henchman. He ended up having power within his geopolitical region that governors, educated men, senators, house of reps would come and they would kneel down and beg to ask for favors to be connected to the top so that they can keep their position in their hallowed offices. His convoy was bigger than the convoy of the governors. And when he came into a place, they would stand up and they will recognize him first. No education. Now, when we see this happening, and these are who our heroes are, so when we see this happening over and over and over again, then what do you expect the young people to want to look up to? Education? Forget it. Morals? Extinct. Values? Who is talking about that? Hard work? Are you kidding? Why? There's no point. There's no point. Who do you celebrate? Is it Naomi? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Soldiers? I know a general who said to me, a general serving in the army, that his son says that he wants to be a soldier. And he said to him, no. In this nation, there are nations where generations follow the trend. He's a serving general. And he says, no. And I asked him, why? He says, because our nation does not respect our heroes. We forget them. Is it Dr. Adadevo? Is it Stella? Uh, sorry, just, just, uh, Justina Ejolonu? The nurse that died from Ebola? Who remembers them? They are already past history. Who are our heroes in Nigeria. Police? The police is your hero? <laughs> ah, we laugh. And I'm glad I made you laugh. However, this policeman that you just laughed at risk their lives every single day. Every single day for you. We laughed at them. <laughs> and believe me, I know. Yes, they're not all great. But I know policemen, and that the, first, the day you enter trouble, the first place you go is you still go to that policeman that you just laughed at. And they would come. The day somebody is kidnapped in your family, you will go. And they will go and try. And they lose their lives every single day. But we don't celebrate them. We don't. Rather, we laugh. Road safety on the highway? Same. Who are our heroes? Who do we look up to? Teachers? Teachers? Are they our heroes? Do we remember them? I flew in today and I saw a classmate of mine that I have not seen probably in 30 years from primary school. In our conversation, the last place that we left off was talking about our headmistress in Corona, 
called Mrs. Shashebo. And we remembered her. And I said, when I took my son for the first time as a young man, and you will do the same, God willing, and I took my son to her because I wanted him to go to that same school. I sat in front of her and I felt like a schoolboy again. The same feeling, that is exactly how I felt. Until today, anywhere I see her, I remember the sacrifice that she made to make me who I am. Who do we remember? Who? Ah, today, elevation to the highest post of office is so that we can show how powerful we are. Public servant, 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 are you kidding? Servant no longer exists. Civil servant, no. We have public lords and civil lords. I want to show you that I have a convoy that can push you off the road. And I keep saying, when we know that we have arrived where we want to be, and God willing, our youth will take us there, it's when a serving minister, a big man in Nigeria, so-called, can move from point A to point B and you even know that he has passed. That is when you know that you have arrived. Not when you hear them coming from miles away. For the first time in a long time, and I talk to youths a lot, but this time around, maybe bad demola, but he will have to let me know if I'm talking sense. But this season is the lowest I have felt in the youth's engagement in politics. They have lost interest at this particular point. It's the feeling I get. Now, it's a calm before the storm. And it should worry our leaders deeply. But unfortunately, they don't care. At this point, at this point, as we speak, your thoughts don't matter. Your needs do not matter. Your care, what you care for, really doesn't matter. Right now, we are at the point of dividing and sharing, allocating and anointing, appointing and selecting. That is where we are. Now, once we have finished all of that, once everything has been determined, who is getting what, where and how, then they will come to you. So that you can endorse the process with a show of votes. How long do you want to be used? How long? Now, Nigeria is an interesting country. There is no doubt in my heart that this is a blessed land. On that, I am certain. That we are a great country called for greatness, absolutely. And that's why I said he ended with part of my speech. Because everything he said about you finding that you must go through pain to enjoy what victory is, that you must go through a lot of this, if not, you will never appreciate what freedom really is. That's all true. Nigeria would have been in the ground had it not been for that. However, however, we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. I don't know the kind of Nigeria that you expect. I don't know whether you prefer that your local government chairman or chairwoman or chair lady or chairperson, however they are called, is chosen for you or whether you have a say in electing them, in determining the process with which they have to first go through before they can take a platform for the primaries. At this point, you know you have no say, but I don't know if that's the country you're looking for. I don't know if you are interested in Nigeria's unity, as Demola talked about. A unity that really sees, when we talk about unity, that really sees that I can get up and rather than be from River State, I've lived in Lagos most of my life, but I cannot even begin to contemplate today 
that I'm going to run for office in Lagos as a governor in Lagos, even though I've paid taxes there, I've gone to school there, I've done everything there, I will never be elected. Yet we had a Nigeria at one point when an Enamdi Azikwe would go for election in the Western region and be appointed or elected into parliament. We have a nation where an Umoru Atine from the caliphate of Sokoto to understand how deep a Fulani of Fulanis lived in Enugu, ran for office in Enugu, and became the first mayor of Enugu in the late 50s. Today, you cannot contemplate it. Am I in a position to usher in the Nigeria that I want to live in? Are you in that position? I don't know. We can only do what we can do. And that's what I believe Ricochet is all about. It's about ideas that move and bounce off people. If you are not observant, that idea can kill you. That's a ricochet of a bullet. But if you're observant, it can make you into who you really want to be. Kate has warned me that I have to stay on time. So I'm going to move into the last part of this. When you look around the world and take a history, take a look at history, every nation where leadership has been forced on people, it's never, it's never ever grown strong. Every nation where the people feel that they have not had a say, a say in the process that brought out the leaders for which they voted for has never survived. They can be quiet. The fact that they are quiet, the fact that they are not talking, the fact that they are not on the street does not mean that they accept the situation. I'm, I can bet my last dollar, I can bet the very last couple that I have, that if you ask Kampori six months ago if he was loved by his people, he will tell you yes, that he was very loved by them. After all, he had been there for 27 years. That that is the greatest love that a people can show you. All it took was an opportunity that the people felt had come where their voices could matter. That's all. That their voices could matter and they took it. President Ward in Senegal, exactly the same thing. I was in the room with Baba at the time, sitting in front of this old man and they were begging him that he should not run for election. I was sitting down there I went as an observer. I could not believe what I was hearing and what I was seeing. Where he was saying that they love him, they will vote for him, he's not going. I thank God he saw sense and left. The only time a population can be truly free, the only time they can be free is when they express themselves openly without being afraid that they will be labeled as enemies of states. A lot of you really can't stand politics. And that's the truth. You can't stand the politics you see. You can't stand it. You may tolerate it, but you cannot stand it. And so when I see passionate people like Demola get up, and ask you to come and join him to raise 30% young people to go. You listen, you love the message, but you're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> but my greatest worry is that one day, the frustration, that silent frustration that is bubbling inside of you, and he mentioned it, will erupt. 
And it leads to one thing and one thing alone. Violence, insurgency, riots. But guess what? And this is where, I, this is where my prayer holds strong. There is nowhere that this violence that has erupted has ushered in the kind of leaders that you want. Because there are people who are specialized in taking advantage of your pain. So as you get up onto the street and you push out whichever government is in power, another one worse than the one you pushed out comes in. It's happened in Nigeria before. June 12th, typical example. Went out onto the street, screamed and shouted. Babangida stepped aside. I don't know who came in. <laughs> but we're leaving testimonies to that. So I want us to take a deep breath. I want us to reflect. I want us to think seriously about what we stand for as a nation. For a few years, I have traversed this nation north, south, east, west. I have friends across religions. I have friends across tribes. I have friends of different tongues. I know Nigerians from every state in this nation, every state. And I've asked them this one question. Nobody has been able to answer. Maybe you can answer. I said, what is that one thing? One, one, one ideology, one idea, one thing that binds all of us together in this room. One, that we all stand up for and we say that we believe this is what unifi unites us as Nigerians. This is the ideology that we believe in, that we stand for, and that we will die for. We are just divided. We don't have an ideology. We don't have something we stand for. We don't have a rallying point that we can hold on to as Nigerians. Now, the greatest nations in the world have found that one thing and they have stood by it. Their people have held on to it and they have believed in it and they have grown because of that ideology. Whether it's the US and their sense of freedom, they will die for it, they will stand on it, they made it a constitutional right. They teach their children from school all about it. None of us are Americans, yet we can quote the, the we can quote parts of their constitution over and over again. We know exactly when I say what is the what's the, is it the fifth uh, fifth amendment. Everybody knows it. Yet none of us have sworn to the allegiance or the flag of allegiance, but we know the American constitution or parts of it more than we know any part of the Nigerian constitution. A man said to me, while I was in the US a couple of months ago, he said that a nation is truly developed when you find, when you find in its prisons, men and women of all levels of society. He said, if you don't know anyone from your class, from your social status, from your rank, from your family who is in prison, your nation is not developed. And I sat down and I thought about it and truly, I know people of my class who are or who entered prison in London and in America. Plenty. 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 I cannot tell you of one classmate of mine in my last 47 years that I know that ever entered prison in Nigeria. Not one. The only people I've ever read about in Nigeria of the social class that we will call this, that have ever entered prison is because they did something that the man in power did not like. And so he threw them in prison. Only poor people without connections land in prison. A few months ago, a young man who has a mental problem was brought to me at the redemption camp. 
And I saw him. I spoke to him. A few minutes, I knew this guy was not stable. That he was, he really needed medical attention. So I started making arrangements for him to t get medical attention. Called his family and all of that. Delivered him to the family. The next minute, he came. He was caught with a, the, in this whole Boko Haram thing. We have to be very careful about security and all of that. And he came with a keg of petrol and matches and lay in front of the altar and said he was going to burn himself up and all of that. So I interviewed him, pulled him aside. We seized that, talked to him, called his family and all and left him. A few days later, I get a frantic call from his uncle that they can't find him. I say, what happened? He said, the, something, someone called and said that he was arrested. So I called back, and yes, he was found that he had taken some chairs and he had burnt them, and so he was arrested. The quickest, fastest magistrate verdict that I've ever seen. He was arrested today. Within a few days, they had, re they had remanded him to Abukta prison. In a few days. I said, if this boy, this is a suicidal case. I said, if this boy stays in prison, he is going to commit suicide. I had to work making calls to get him out. In a few days, he came out. And I thought about it. And I said, only the poor and unconnected end up in prison. Nobody else. That's not the country we want. It's not the country I'm interested in. It's not the country I want us to live in. And so I'm calling on the youth and I'm saying to them, what do we stand for? Who can find that answer for us? You want a generational shift. We are ready to give it. You have to take it. But you can only take it if you can rally your generation around something they would believe in. If you don't have that message, we would come, we would speak, they would clap, and everybody will go and chase one thing that they love to chase, which is money. Thank you. God bless.